Hello and welcome to our October 3rd online service. We would love to know where you're watching from today. So let us know in the chat box where you are and how your leaves are looking so far this year. My name is Ken and I'm on staff here at Sobel Church and I'm gonna be your host today. Fall is my favorite season. I love the temperature, I love the colors, I love Thanksgiving dinner. There's just something about being around the table with great friends and family to share a meal together that I find special. Today, during our service, we are going to be spending time together at the Lord's table, remembering the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples as they celebrated the Passover together and Jesus looked towards the cross and the ultimate sacrifice that he would make with his broken body and shed blood. He told us to break bread and drink the cup together as a way of remembering this event, but also as an encouragement and reminder to us that Jesus is coming again one day. We would encourage you, if Jesus is Lord of your life, join us at the table today. Just get some juice and bread or a cracker and be ready as Chris leads in this at the close of service today. We are going to be in our third week of our Reset series and we are excited to worship together. But before we get to that, here are this week's updates. We were saddened this past week as we heard of the passing of Marilyn Day this past Tuesday morning, and we continue to pray for Doug and the rest of the family. Visitation will be at Sauble Christian Fellowship Saturday, October 9th from 11 a.m. till 12.30 p.m with the service following at 1 p.m. For more information, search Henry Walzer Funeral Home. Ladies, this is for you. In just a few weeks, Fall Secret Friend will kick off again this year. Starting October 18th for four weeks long, Fall Secret Friend is a fun way to keep connected and maybe even meet someone new from our community. You can bless your secret friend with a special card, a small gift, or some goodies. Get creative. We can't wait to hear what you thought up. Sign up now to be a part of this year's Fall Secret Friend by going to sobelchurch.ca slash events or email women at sobelchurch.ca for more information. This week is the first Sunday of the month. So along with celebrating communion together, we are also going to collect a benevolent offering. As we announced last week, all of the money that comes in for this offering will, today will go towards assisting the chapel family as Kim prepares to head for a specialized back operation. Everything that comes in towards this will be matched up to $5,000. Thank you in advance for giving and standing together with the chapel family. Do you ever feel like you read the Bible and it just doesn't seem to sink in? then why not say yes to our fall reading challenge of the Gospel of John? It's super simple. Here's how it works. For the month of October, every day, read John chapters one to seven. Then, beginning November 1st, move to chapters eight to 14 each day. Then, for the month of December, finish up by reading chapters 15 to 21 every day. If you do this, by the end of December, you will have read the entire Gospel of John 30 times. As we prepare our hearts and minds to focus in a time of worship together today, I want to ask you, what are you thankful for today? I hope whatever season of life you find yourself in, that you can take time to pause and remember how good God has been to you. Let's focus our hearts and our minds on the Lord as we sing together. Let me pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that uh, whether we are in a season of lots of highs or we're in a season of, of difficulty, that God, you are still good. We think of many of our families that are connected to uh, our church here. Uh, the Days, uh, the Brothertons, uh, Wilsons, Swartz and Trubers. Uh, God, we've got so many of our families that are just dealing with really difficult uh, situations. Uh, many of our families that probably have things going on that we don't even know, but God, you, we know that you know. Uh, you know each uh, situation, 
better than any of us could. You know what is needed. And God, we would just pray your presence into each family, God, into each home, that as they focus on you, uh, that no matter what uh, comes their way, God, that they would be able to stay focused on you uh, above all. And God, we want to do that this morning. We want to focus completely on you. Uh, move aside anything in our, in our minds that would be distracting this morning, that would cause us not to focus completely. And just push those things aside, God, that we would be able to uh, just have one, uh, one focus in our minds today, and that is of you, Lord. That uh, doesn't matter what happened this week, doesn't matter what will happen this coming week, God, that we would know your love, that we would know your presence, that we would know your peace in each and every situation. Uh, we are your children, you are our Father God, and uh, we love you. We want to spend our time lifting our voices in praise of you today. And so be pleased with our worship and be pleased with our hearts that we offer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I don't know about you, but I find those verses that were just on the screen really convicting. I've told you before that there are times when I teach or preach, and by the way, today's gonna be 
way more teachy than preachy. It would actually be uh, helpful if you had your Bible uh, open in front of you. We're going to turn to, to uh, three places at least. But there are times where I teach or preach and I feel like I'm doing it from a position of strength. Like I've got something to say. There's some credibility. God has, has uh, helped and uh, there's been some victory and, and whatnot. Today is not one of those days. We're talking about prayer. And I feel like I'm coming at this whole thing today from a position of weakness. Like, think of it. Jesus takes off by himself to go to, to solitary places to pray to be alone with God. At times, he would uh, get up while it's dark and go out and to pray. And on other occasions, he would, he would go out um, to a mountainside. He would spend all night in prayer. Like Jesus would do that. If, if Jesus did that, how much more do I need to do that? How much more do we need to do that? You know, we say we follow Jesus. And uh, we post uh, all over the place in both analog and uh, digital uh, formats this notion uh, just over my shoulder that we want to become like Jesus. Well, this is, this is Jesus spending not just quality time in prayer, but quantity time in prayer, often at night, often all night. Jesus was devoted the prayer. And so this, uh, this theme is, is pretty convicting uh, for me, and maybe you feel the same way. You've probably, uh, most of you, if not all of you, have at some point been a passenger on a commercial jet, um, and you know the instructions that the flight attendants give. And uh, they will say things like, uh, here's what a seatbelt looks like, here's how it works. And uh, they'll instruct about the, the flotation devices. Uh, they'll talk about the emergency exits. They'll give those very famous uh, directions, you know, these kinds of things. Like, boy, if there's ever an emergency, it'd be like, oh, what were those? Oh yeah, it was this, we're okay now. Um, and, and they would talk about the uh, oxygen masks. Right, and and um, they would say something like, if the cabin, if if the airplane is is suddenly loses cabin pressure, there will be oxygen masks that will drop down uh, from above you, and uh, here's how you put those things on. You pull the little tabbies down, but they will make a statement something like this: If you are traveling with children, make sure you put your own oxygen mask on first, and then look after the children. Like that, that just goes against everything that's hardwired into a parent, right? We just, we want to look after the kids first and make sure they're okay. But the, but the instructions are given very, very clear. Put your own mask on first and then look after the kids. You see, moms and dads need oxygen in order to be able to look after the kids. If you're a parent and you pass out, you're unconscious, you're not going to be much good looking after the kids. Well, followers of Jesus, we receive the oxygen of God, so to speak, in prayer. Again, Jesus would go out while it's still dark. He would go out to a solitary place to pray, sometimes praying all night long. And think about like, uh, what, would it, what is it? Matthew 4, where he goes into the wilderness to pray for 40 days and fasts right before his public ministry begins. Jesus put his own oxygen mask on first. Jesus did that. Well, let's begin with Acts 2, 42. Of course, we're in this series that we're calling Reset, Recapturing the Creative Simplicity of the Early Church. It's a mini series, it's six parts, and today is part three. And uh, so we started in, in verse 42, which says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We talked about this in week one. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching about Jesus. This isn't the New Testament. It's not written yet. This is what the apostles um, taught about Jesus, including the very words 
of Jesus. And so we ask ourselves the question on week one, what would it look like if we were to press reset and to devote ourselves to taking seriously the words of Jesus, to look at the words of Jesus and say, let's just assume that Jesus meant what he said and let's just do that. How would that revolutionize the church today? And then uh, last week, we looked at the fact that all these believers, these brand new believers in Jesus in this brand new church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to fellowship, to koinonia, to their commonality and what they held in common was Jesus. And so we asked ourselves the question, what would it look like if we pressed reset and devoted ourselves to the power of our commonality and our connectedness in Jesus and to see that as so strong that it can bear the weight of all kinds of differences of opinion about things of secondary importance. And so today in part three, we wanna finish off verse 42. And uh, so let's just uh, say this, that all the believers devoted themselves to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and we are gonna celebrate the Lord's Supper today and to prayer. And so today we wanna to talk about this, this thing of prayer. This early church wasn't a perfect church, but man, they came out of the chute with an, with an incredible understanding of the fundamentals. This early church in Jerusalem was a praying church. Well, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at three passages in the book of Acts that really point out this early church and their devotion to praying. Uh, but just before we look at the first passage, I want to, I want to uh, read a quote. It comes from Samuel Chadwick, and he, um, he would have written these words about a hundred years ago. And he says, Satan dreads nothing but prayer. His one concern is to keep the saints from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. The early church was a praying church. Sobel Church is a church that prays, absolutely. But can it be said of Sobel Church that we are a praying church? I think there's a difference between a church that prays and a praying church. I am a pastor who prays, but can it be said of me that I am a praying pastor? All right, this is where that conviction comes in and it, it hits pretty close to home. Well, the first uh, passage that we're gonna look at is Acts chapter one. So you can turn back there, Acts chapter one, and find your way to verse 12. And uh, verse 12 says these words, then, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Let me just give a little bit of context here. So uh, Jesus has just ascended. He's returned uh, back to the Father in heaven, and he did so from the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives between Jerusalem and Bethany. And so now the apostles are heading back to Jerusalem. So verse 13, when they arrived in Jerusalem, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Different Judas. Uh, this one elsewhere is called uh, Thaddeus, I think. Like sometimes I think, just pick a name and go with it. It's, it gets confusing. I love this 14th verse. I am using my old trusty NIV today because I particularly, this 14th verse, I love the first seven words. These are seven of my favorite, very favorite words in the New Testament. Look what it says. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There's two things I want us just to very quickly notice from verse 14. One is their unity and the other is their consistency. Look at that 14th verse and notice the unity language here. They all, not some, not most, not many, but all joined. How did they join together? speaks of unity and their unity is much more than just simply being all in the same room at the same time. These people are, are, are together. They're of one heart and mind. They're, they're um, 
coming to God in prayer with a singular focus, there's unity here. They all join together constantly. And that speaks of uh, consistency and perseverance as well. And uh, let's just take a second and notice why they're here in this room, why they're all joined together constantly in prayer in the first place. Why are they here? Why are they in this room? Well, there's two reasons. One is because of a command and the other is because of a promise, a command and a promise. And to see those, you've got to go back to verse four, chapter one and verse four. It says, on one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command. So here it is. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. So here comes the promise. He says, which you've heard me speak about. And then you go into verse five and that promise is identified as the fact that they're going to be uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then that promise is reiterated in verse eight, uh, where, where it says, um, and, and when the Spirit is poured out, you're going to be empowered to witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so at this point, the apostles would have looked at each other and said, okay, this is really clear. We've got a command. Don't leave Jerusalem. We've got a promise. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. And so on the basis of this command and on the strength of this promise, let's pray. And so they all joined together constantly in prayer. This is um, instructional for us, I think, in a number of ways, at least in this way. The promises of God do not make prayer unnecessary. The promises of God do not make prayer unnecessary. The fact that, that God has promised something, made promises, does not mean that we do not need to boldly seek him in prayer in relation to those promises. In fact, it's the promises of God that form the very basis upon which we pray in faith. You know, sometimes you hear people talking rather flippantly about prayer and they'll say, you know, prayer is just asking God for things and you can just ask for whatever you want and as long as you've got faith and you believe and, and if you add the magic words at the end in Jesus' name, um, then you just ask God for what you want and he'll give it to you. Um, like I say, I'm coming at this, I feel like from a position of weakness, but can I say that that kind of attitude about prayer does not sound like praying in faith, it sounds like praying in presumption. I think there's a big difference between praying in faith and praying in presumption. Like I could, I could, pray, I could say, God, make me six foot four. Uh, do I believe that God could do that? Sure. God can do anything. Could I pray that? Believing that he actually could do that? Yeah, I could add the words in Jesus' name at the end of it. But uh, God nowhere has promised to make me six foot four. That is a prayer of presumption. I wouldn't pray that prayer somehow feeling like God is obligated to do that. So I guess I'll just have to learn to be content being uh, six foot one. See, praying in faith takes the clear promise of God and prays it back to him. Let me give you an example of what I mean. There's a, there's a beautiful little promise in Isaiah chapter 26. It's repeated elsewhere in the Old Testament. It's also repeated in the New Testament. And it's, it's a prayer that we can, um, it's a promise that we can really grab onto for ourselves. And, and the Isaiah version of this promise goes something like this. God will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is stayed upon him, riveted uh, to him, fastened upon him. And so what would it look like to pray that promise back to God in prayer? Well, it might look something like this. God, I'm coming to you today and I'm coming to you on the, the strength of your word and, and, and the power and the certainty of this promise that you've made. You said, God, that you will keep me in perfect peace as I choose to focus my sights on you. And so God, today in this moment, I'm coming to you. My thoughts feel scattered. I'm experiencing anxiety. Um, I, I feel uncertainty in, in certain areas of my life. And so I'm bringing that 
anxiety, that uncertainty, that distractedness to you in prayer. And I'm choosing to focus on you. And so God, would you be true to your word? Would you fulfill your promise in my life and bring to me your perfect peace in this moment? And, you know, when we pray like that, we are praying in faith. We're praying according to what he's promised. And I, th I think we need to learn to do that more and more. I need to learn to do that more and more. Praying the promises of God back to God. And then just listening, just being still and letting God meet with you and letting God speak to you. See, when it comes to the Bible, there is a place for exegesis, certainly. Like last week, for instance, we said, okay, this early church devoted themselves to the fellowship. That's the Greek word koinonia. The root of that is koinos. It means common, so therefore, blah, blah, blah. There's a place for that, for digging in, in rigorous fashion, and, and um, seeing the meaning come out of the text. There's a place for that. But there's also a place that I think we neglect. And it's the place where we just take the scripture and we read the promise of God and then we just close the Bible and we say, God, for the next 15 minutes, I wanna just hear from you. I wanna hear what you have to say. God, would you speak to me your truth about how this promise can become realized in my life, in my circumstances, in my moment right now, today? And God will speak with you. I don't want to go all charismatic on you here, but God will speak with you. He doesn't speak to me in an audible voice, but he speaks to me in my heart. And he says, if you've got ears to hear, I will speak with you. And the, and the crazy thing is, well, not crazy, but you could read that same promise like a month later. And you could say the same thing. God, would you speak your truth to me? And he'll speak something different, like not contradictory, but just different because it's a month later and it's different circumstances and maybe your heart has a different need in that moment and God will speak in different ways if we'll listen. You know, one of the disciplines that I think we need to learn more, I definitely need to learn more, is to learn to listen more than I talk in prayer. Don't we so often do all the talking in prayer, right? Like, wouldn't it be weird to have a relationship where one person did 100% of the talking, and we so often pray like that. And then we say amen, which is the equivalent of hanging up the phone, right? We need to learn to listen to God. We need to learn to listen to Jesus more than talking to him. Um, one time Mother Teresa was interviewed and she was asked the question, when you pray, what do you say to God? And she said, I don't say anything. I just listen. And then this was a pretty clever interviewer. So the interviewer said, well, when, when you listen to God, what does he say to you? And she said, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. And then she added, and if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. Well, let's, let's go to, to passage number two. Let's go to Acts chapter four and find your way to verse 23. Acts chapter four and verse 23. And it says, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So what's happened earlier in chapter four, Peter and John have been arrested. They've been thrown in jail overnight. Then they're hauled into court the next morning. This is religious court. These are Jewish religious leaders who are... Um, threatening Peter and John. And when they're in front of these uh, religious leaders, Peter and John say things like uh, verse 12, um, you know, there's no other name under heaven given among men other than the name of Jesus by which you must be saved. And uh, so anyway, these religious leaders, they warn Peter and John not to talk anymore, not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. We see that in verse uh, 18, they're told not to speak or to teach anymore in that name. And you get down to verse 21. Um, verse 21 says, after further threats, 
they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Well, what happened was back in chapter three, there's this guy uh, uh, who'd been kind of a fixture at the temple gate for like 40 years. He was lame, he couldn't walk. He sat there every day and begged for money while he uh, met Peter and John, and then he's miraculously healed. And this guy, uh, everybody knows him. Everybody knows th this guy's story. And now he's bouncing all over Jerusalem and all around the temple, praising God and talking about the fact that uh, he encountered Peter and John, and then he was healed in the name of Jesus. And everybody's just like excited and super psyched about this, and they know it's legit because they've known this guy for 40 years. And so these Jewish religious leaders can't come down too hard on Peter and John because really the people are pretty excited about this miracle. And so verse 23, on their release, they threatened them, let them go. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they go back to their own People And I want us to notice the response of the church, of the Jesus followers who are gathered here. Verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Praying is always the first and best response to trouble. And they prayed. And then as you look down the, the uh, next few verses, it's, it's uh, how they prayed. Now I want us to notice how they prayed. They prayed, first of all, in relation to who God is, character, and, and so on. And in fact, in verse 24, they say, God, you are the God of creation. You made the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 25, they acknowledge that he's the God of revelation. You spoke, you revealed yourself. You're the God of creation you made. You're the God of revelation you spoke. And then you look down to verse uh, 28, for instance, and, and uh, they say, God, you, um, you decided you're the God of history. We see your fingerprints all along. We see your actions all throughout history. So, so th they, they pray and they say, God, you're the God of creation you made. You're the God of revelation you spoke. You're the God of of um, history, you decided, you did, we see your actions. And it's like, before they pray, they just, they just get this understanding, they just get this framework of God, his character, his track record firmly in their minds before they bring their requests. And you know, I think there's something instructional there for us. Because how else are we gonna know to ask God for big things, unless we know how big God is. How are we going to know to ask for wonderful and beautiful things unless we know how wonderful and how beautiful God is? Effective prayer requires an understanding of the very nature of God himself and his track record. And so that's how they begin their prayer. And then they become um, specific. And we see that in verse 29. They prayed, first of all, that the Lord would consider their threats consider their threats. I find it interesting that they don't pray, God, stop their threats. No, it's just consider their threats. God, you know what's going on. Just, just consider that, consider their threats. And then secondly, in the latter half of verse 29, they ask the Lord to enable them to speak the word with boldness. So consider their threats, first of all, and then enable your servants to speak with great boldness, uh, secondly. And, and I find it significant that they don't pray for better circumstances, but rather they pray for boldness in the midst of these existing difficult circumstances. And then thirdly, they pray in verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So that's their prayer time. So Peter and John have this really uh, incredible encounter. They're thrown in jail. Then they're hauled into court the next day. Uh, they're threatened like crazy. Um, they get released. They go back to the church and the church's first response is to pray. And they pray, God, you're the God of creation. You made the heavens and the earth. You're the God of revelation. You spoke and revealed yourself. You're the God of history. Um, you decided. We see your fingerprints all through history. And then they pray specifically. Consider their threats, enable your servants to speak with boldness, and show yourself to be strong all over the place. Well, what was the result of that prayer time? Well, if you look at verse 31, it says, After they prayed, 
the place where they were meeting was shaken. <laughs> um, that's a very Old Testament picture. You got to remember that these are Jewish believers. They were very familiar with the the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish scriptures. And uh, if you read through the Old Testament, there are various times where you will see a um, a building shaking, and that was. That was the sign of a theophany, which means an appearance of God. God shows up and he shakes the building. So they would have immediately understood um, what this means. This is a manifestation of the presence of God. And, uh, and then it says in verse um, 31 that God filled them with the spirit and enabled them to speak the word of God boldly. And so, yeah, here's answered prayer. Now, this, this business of shaking the building is that... Um, is that prescriptive or is that merely descriptive? Is this something we should expect uh, to happen or was it merely descriptive of their experience? Well, I think it was descriptive of them. Remember this context, these are brand new Jewish believers and this is a very Old Testament uh, picture that they would have very clearly understood. I think what is prescriptive for us though is this, um, this practice of of joining together in prayer, being of one heart, one mind in prayer, understanding the character of God, the track record of God, and praying uh, specifically um, and seeing God do what God does. And I think when we pray, God can shake us, uh, but I'm not expecting him and I'm actually hoping he doesn't uh, shake the building. There's every reason in the world for us to gather together and ask God to, to do the very same thing. Uh, you might say, well, I don't see where their request about miracles uh, was answered here. But if you flip over the page to chapter 5 and verse uh, 12, it says the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. So uh, these prayers are answered. Um, third passage, and let's, let's do this quickly. Go over to Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12. And um, I would love to read a bunch of this, but I don't want to take the time to do that. Let me encourage you to read chapter 12 at home on your own. It's an exciting chapter. It's, it's got some humor in it. It's got action in it. It's got uh, some irony in it. It's, it's got it all. It's a really interesting chapter of scripture. And it, it begins... Uh, with King Herod. And Herod, is he's a puppet of Rome. He's, he's king in uh, Judea um, over the, the Jewish people. And basically his, his job description is to keep the religious Jews happy and religious. And uh, so he does that. He keeps the, the religious Jews happy by persecuting Jesus followers and by uh, uh, grabbing Jesus followers and putting them in jail and even killing Jesus followers. In fact, by the time you get to the first part of of chapter 12, Herod has already grabbed uh, James, the brother of John, and he's been martyred. He's been put to death by the sword. And Peter's also been arrested by Herod. Peter uh, is in prison in Acts chapter 12 here. So you've got Herod large and in charge. You know, last week we talked about how the kingdoms of this world operate according to power, wealth, and recognition, pulling those levers. Well, here's Herod exercising power, wealth, and, and recognition, demanding recognition and coercing it and threatening and all of these things. You know, if you, if you, if you looked at this opening part of this chapter, you'd think there's, this is a really lopsided story. Because if you look at verse 5, what, what's the church doing? while all of this is going on, while Herod's being all large and in charge. Well, verse five says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. You know, if I wasn't initiated to Christianity and I was just looking at this as, as an outsider, I would say, man, this is, this is so lopsided. We've got King Herod up here. He's got all the power. And what are these Christians doing? They're huddled together praying, <laughs> right? I might say, well, these, these Christians need to, they need to flex some, some power and they need to demand some recognition, right? And sometimes churches are inclined to want to push for recognition and, and, and try and exercise 
power. But when the church tries to win that way, they've lost even before they've begun. Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. It's not, you know, it, it almost seems like the church sometimes think power changes things instead of prayer changes things. And so here's this early church gathered earnestly and praying. And so Peter's in prison. And if you look at verse six, uh, you find out that, that um, Peter's in jail. And the next day, he's, he's going to go before Herod. And he's likely going to face the same outcome that, that uh, James is. He's going to be uh, put to death. He's going to be martyred. He's like on deck uh, here for that. <laughs> but you look at verse six. What is Peter doing? He's sleeping. This is amazing. He's sleeping between two soldiers. That's, that's like one of the greatest things in the New Testament, right? Here's Peter in prison. He's very likely going to be martyred the next day. And he's sleeping between two soldiers. Like, do you think Peter knew that he was in the hands of God? Do you think Peter had confidence in the resurrected living Jesus? Absolutely. Not only is he chained to two soldiers, but there's two soldiers at the door as well. You see, uh, they weren't taking any chances because if you remember back in Acts 5, there'd been some shenanigans and some unexplained prison breaks and they're not gonna let that happen again. Well, Peter slept. And you know, if you, um, if you went forward a couple of chapters, you'd find that uh, Paul, Paul's in prison in I think it's chapter 14 and he's singing, he's singing him. So Paul sings in prison. Here we've got Peter sleeping in prison and the church is praying. The church is gathered and praying. And I'd love to read this, but let me just very, very quickly say, and if you've read this, you know, you know what happens. You know how the story goes. If you haven't, please do read it. But, but an angel shows up, right? And it says there's, and, and the place was filled with light. It's like this angel shows up and it's, ah, um, here's this angel. And then the angel looks at Peter and he's still sleeping. And so the angel's got to kind of kick him in the ribs. And I sort of play this movie in my head and I imagine, you know, the angel waking up Peter and then going again, oh, 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 Peter, you're awake now. Great, get up, uh, uh, get, your, get your coat on. And, and the, 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 uh, the chains fall off of Peter and the angel leads him right out of the jail and they go outside and down the street and the gate to the city just opens automatically and they're going down the street. And Peter at this point doesn't know Am I dreaming this? Am I asleep or am I actually awake? Well, you get to verse uh, 12 and it says, when this had dawned on him, in other words, he just, wow, this is actually happening. He's pinching himself and it's like, ouch, I'm actually awake. And so he's been uh, broken out of jail by uh, this angel. It's, it's a miracle. And so what does he do? Verse 12, he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, again, like pick a name and go with it. This is confusing, but I think we know who, who that is. Um, because this is the house where the church is gathered and they're praying. And this is, this is where it gets kind of hubris on the one hand, because back in those days, when you went to somebody's house, you, would not, you wouldn't just knock on the door and expect them to open the door for you. You would knock and you would, you would call out your name. Hi, it's, it's Peter, it's me, open up the door. And, um, and so everybody, you know, the, the church is in there, they're in a room, they're praying and they're praying for Peter there because he's in, in jail. Right. And so there's a servant girl. I think her name is Rhoda. If I remember correctly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Rhoda. And she's so excited. She's a believer and she knows Peter and she's so excited. She hears Peter's voice and she's so excited. She doesn't even open the door. Instead, she runs down the hallway. She goes into the room where all of these people are praying for Peter. And she says, you'll never guess what Peter's at the door. And they're like, uh, no, Peter's in jail. Hello. That's why we're praying here. Uh, leave us alone, please. And it's kind of, uh, ironic that they are praying and, um, are kind of shocked when God answers their prayers. Well, long story short, uh, they finally let Peter in. Peter, um, you know, tells them everything that had, had happened. Um, and let me say this, this 12th chapter ends in opposite fashion to how it started. Remember it started, Herod 
is large and in charge, power, wealth, recognition, and what's the church doing? Well, they're praying. But the chapter ends with Peter released, the word of God spreading, the church growing, and Herod dies. And he doesn't just die. He, he's eaten by worms and he dies. Like, you know, I, I don't think there's any good way to be put to death by the sword. That's what James had experienced. But I'd way rather have that than to be, to die by being eaten by worms, right? So it ends in really lopsided fashion. Let's, um, let's shift gears here. Uh, I want to celebrate communion uh, today. And what I'd like you to do, I want you to listen to a passage of scripture being read. It's, it's Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. And, it's, and, and I want us to listen to this because it's associated with the Lord's Supper. It's right after the, the last supper that Jesus has with the, uh, with the disciples. And it's just before he gets arrested. And it talks a lot about prayer. And it talks about the devotion of Jesus to prayer. And it also shows how difficult it is for us to be devoted to prayer. Listen to these words. Matthew 26, verse 36 says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. You can feel the emotion in that account as it's read and how hmm, convicting to almost imagine Jesus at the end of this encounter saying, so what is it guys? Are you going to sleep or are you going to pray? Well, I hope you have uh, some bread or cracker, some juice, uh, whatever you have for communion. What you use is way less important than what it symbolizes. It symbolizes the, the body of Jesus that was broken for us and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. So I'm just going to go backwards a little bit in Matthew's gospel here, back to the Last Supper, just before that account that we just heard read. And verse 26 says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, the body of Jesus broken for you. Let's eat together.
Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Let's drink together. It says, I tell you, these are the words of Jesus. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And then it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And that's where Gethsemane is. And that's where that encounter comes in that was read for us. And Gethsemane literally means oil press. The Mount of Olives is literally a mountain of olive trees and... Um, it is there that, that Jesus experienced such overwhelming agony in, in sorrow. The early church was a praying church. They were devoted to prayer. What would it look like for us to press reset and to devote ourselves to prayer? To praying in unity and consistency. To praying with an understanding of who God is, his character and his track record. And then praying specifically, praying the promises of God and then listening to him, letting him speak, letting him shake us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we confess together today. You are the God of creation. You are the God of heaven and earth. You made it all. And there's none like you. There's none beside you. You alone are God. And we confess together today that you are the God who has revealed yourself through all of the things that you've made. You've revealed yourself through your word and Ultimately, most clearly, most definitively, you've revealed yourself through your son, the Lord Jesus. And together, we confess that all of history, God, is your story. It's your love story. It's the story of you pursuing relationship with us in love. Love that is demonstrated nowhere more clearly than at the cross. Jesus, where your body was broken and your blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sin. Father, I pray that you would help us more and more to see the power of your invitation to come boldly before your throne of grace with no appointment necessary, promising that we'll find you merciful. God, would you teach us your promises? Help us to learn to pray in faith. And God, you know the uncertainty that we feel in these days. And so would you give us boldness to proclaim you, Jesus, as Prince of Peace. And God, would you show up in unmistakable ways and maybe not shake the building. In fact, we'd prefer that not be the case. But would you shake us? Would you awaken us to recapture a devotion to prayer of being still before you, listening to you and knowing that you are God. Amen. God bless you.
Prayer is so vitally important in the life of a church. If you're in need of prayer today, or just need to share something that God has placed on your heart, you can connect with someone anytime by going to prayer.sobblechurch.ca. Do you need more information on something that you heard today? Or maybe you just have never let us know that you're joining us online each week. We would love to hear from you. Head over to hello.sobblechurch.ca and fill out a quick form. Well, that's all for today. Thank you once again for joining us, and we hope to see you back again next week, where we once again hope to encourage you in your journey to know God, become like Jesus, and change our world. Have a great week.